Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Luke Hunt. This is another podcast for The Diplomat. And with me today is the author and Killing Field survivor, Lut Un, who has just written a book, his first book, A Refugee's American Dream, From the Killing Fields of Cambodia to the US Secret Service. Lut, welcome to the program. Good morning, Luke. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor and privilege to be on your podcast. <laughs> Thanks for the kind words. I enjoyed your book very much. There's been many books written about the killing fields and I hope there'll be many, many more given how much damage was done to this country over those years. Your book encompasses your entire life from growing up in Badenbong City, surviving war, and now you're uh, part of the presidential details, looking after presidents, vice presidents. But take us back to Badenbong City. You were five years old, I think, when uh, the Khmer Rouge came in in 1975? Yes, um, I was growing up, we were always poor. My dad was, he served the military in the whole life. My, my mom is a seamstress, and also she had tobacco holders trying to erase it. Me, when I grew up, a three, four years old, uh, very sick child, that's why I had two or three mothers to help me to raise me. They put a lot of effort, a lot of energy to, uh, to raise me. Even though we grow up poor, we live in a tight knit community with about six families in other communes. And they, they can't look out for each other. You know, I don't have the luxury that many of the children have today. The house, not considered a house, no wall, roof leaking. It's just poor, simple. No, no shoes to wear to school, no shirts no, to wear and play around. Me and my other friends, we made up game like American call of field hockey, made up bamboos, the old soccer ball, patch it up, play against each other. We, we don't have what many children have there, but we all enjoy our life. It's simple, happy, and uh, they the life that will be had there. Right. Until, you know, of course, 1975, when the communists took over and the country collapsed to the hand of the murderous communists. And despite the poverty that you grew up in, you did go to school. Your father was, uh, he was a soldier. He served in militaries, I guess, before 1975. And, uh, and by the time the Khmer Rouge arrived, he was serving with Lon Nol, who, of course, were the arch enemy of Pol Pot. What happened mm-hmm. next? I mean, my whole family grew up in the military. Uh, my uncle and his older brother in the military, my cousin's military, my, my mom's side, the grandparents' military, and my mom's side, my uncle, most of us, all, almost all of us in the military. My dad, he fought so many different wars to Longno, which is the last before mm-hmm. it collapsed. And many times he was out, we don't have communication, we don't have the cell phone. Soldiers walking by, my mom would ask them if they know anything about my dad, where he's at, why he's not coming home. Many times, days, weeks, and months. One time, he came home, he looked like a wizard, long beard, long hair. Um, my mom didn't recognize him until he stopped to speak to my mom, of course, you know, they broke down in tears. My mom is a kind-hearted person, and when they come back from the battlefields, many of the platoon would come to our house, they all pitch in money to buy you know, cheap beers to celebrate the victory. So again, you know, we were poor, but we were happy then. Right. And then the Khmer Rouge came in and began their purge. They rounded up all the soldiers, all those who were fighting with Lon Nol, and they forced the civilians, including your family, to evacuate the cities. Yeah. And you were pushed out into the countryside where you were tortured and laboured, forced to labour, under extremely yeah. difficult circumstances. Yeah. April 17, 1975 came. It's like the last day of the new year. The the Anka, the, the communist army, took over the control of the country, and the country becomes so chaotic. Gunfire shot in the sky, AK-47, black uniform with the... Uh, the Khmer uniform surrounded all the army soldiers, commandos that put into different locations. You know, evening came. That's why I found him, and he was sitting in one of the 
front of the classroom on his knees now, handkerchief up around his head. Happy to my dad, that's alive. So he told me, you know, I'm going to be okay. He told my mom not to worry about it. But I looked at his facial expression. He knew what's going to happen. But because he did not want us to worry about it, so he said, just go back home. Just tell my mom it would be fine. On the third day, I came in, the whole school was empty. Right. I went to the old lady outside. I asked her, like, you know what happened? All the stories. She like, I don't know. Um, I'm looking for my husband myself. That, that also began one hell of an odyssey. The next three years yes. under the Khmer Rouge. Yeah. So the next day, they forced the evacuate guns. You know, AK-47 fire in the sky. They just kick everybody out. I mean, it's it's almost like a scene in one of the horror movies. And what you can get out of that day is what you have is a backpack, something like rice, anything that you can carry. And my mom, my mom and I, it was like a close relationship after my dad. Yeah, yeah. I, what came through in your book was the bond between you and your mother. It was obviously very yeah. strong. And she basically concocted the story that enabled you to survive under the Khmer Rouge, yeah. which was false names, hide your father's identity. And you had to do that yes. for three and a half years and you were tortured, Three and a half years, yes. laboured in the fields, you know, atrocious conditions, and you were just a kid. Yes. Yeah, so they forced the vernacular, we were in the middle of, you know how it's Cambodian weather, it's monsoon, there's no rain, it's always a monsoon, pretty scorching heat, and my mom's always watch, make sure I make it through. And then we land up to uh, Choice Now, that's where we spent most of the three years and three and a half days, you know, tricked us to tell who we were really. Uh, we have to be uneducated family. We could we, we could write because of uh, skin tones a little lighter than farmers. So they, they were trying to trick us everything humanly possible. Anything that's in the book, they brought it out to make sure. Of course, my mom saw me pull out to the side, told her the whole story. You, know, you don't know your dad, this is your new name. Don't tell me anything about it. Yeah, she made us practice. This, me and my older sister practice as practice. Still, right. it becomes so a reality right. for us back then. And as a child, you don't want any better. It's like, why do I have to change my name? Why do I have to use the fake name, the fake identities? Not knowing, okay, if this is going to happen, you're not going to be dead. I mean, it, it's sad that we have to do that, but I'm sure my father would have understood why. You, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't done that. Right, right. So the basic survival and another thing is do what we can to survive and just like work in the rice paddies. If we don't have enough food, it's meager meals every day and sometimes we eat food in the middle of rain. You know, it's nothing but water in a bowl. We just pretty much drink in water instead of real food. And when it gets scorching hot, the food's always warm, not because from the stove, from the fire, because from the heat. And as soon as we're done eating, there's no time like, okay, you get 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or five minutes, and once you're done, you gotta go back. So I was so many times, my mom had to carry me home because I was skinny to the bone, I'd be able to make it through. Eventually, the Vietnamese invaded and they pushed the Khmer Rouge into the countryside. You were a witness to extraordinary atrocities, and then you started running goods from the Thai border back to Bat and Bong, where you were selling them for a profit with your mother. Then it was the refugee yes. camps and eventually to America. And you survived, yes. your mother survived, and your sister survived. In fact, you, you, I think you were lucky in one sense in that so many of your family did survive. Yeah. How did you feel after the Khmer Rouge were finally evicted and then you still had to survive the next three or four years before you got into a refugee camp? We, we were celebrated in a way. Um, we don't have any government, we don't have any system, nothing yet, it's chaotic. People are trying to create their own trade, change this exchange right as a mean of currency. And there's no import, there's no export, it's everything there, you know, how much can we do, it's not much at all. So things getting tough and tougher. And my mom talked to one of uh, her nice board that's French that we know many, many years back, said, well, what they did is, they went to the Thai border, get some goods, come back and sell it. My mom and I look at each other. And she she didn't want me to go, I, but I refused to let her go by herself. I get 
by that time she's early 60s and throughout the journeys back and forth between there we couldn't carry much what we have with it just enough rice we estimate how it's going to take us to get back there and sometime you know like you just said it's thing is get dangerous and we usually walk at night we don't walk in day and sometimes instead of three days to you know four or five days because it's the gunfight, the landmine, we have to hide for hours and day before we start on it. And we pretty much ate anything that is digestible. We drink out from the elephant footprints. We used to then make a cup from our hands, just scoop the top and go to the next one. We took algae on the top and just drink what we can. Right. So we pretty much lived as animals because we don't have rice, we don't have enough bread, we don't have anything to eat at all. One time uh, in the middle of the day, it's scorching heat. We come out of water, and there's a little pond there that's kind of clean. It's clean the water I haven't seen for days. Yeah. And, you know, me, I'm being me, I'm very curious about something. I looked over to that side. It's like a little wood logs floating. But I walked over, my mom yelled at me and said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to go find it. You know, of course, landmines everywhere, but everyone has to follow uh, each other footprints. So I got there, the three bodies, they're like babies. And I told people, I said, well, these are not wood, these are not logs, and these are bodies. People right. vomited, people got sick a day or two later. Right. Th these were the people who had stepped on landmines and basically the entire family was obliterated, just meters ahead. Yes. Where you know, at least one of many families that uh, they were with us and a uh, husband and wife, two children, child, I couldn't say anything, and elderly do not go any far from us. They're around us like, well, the husband said, I'm going to take my family up there. As soon as I walked up there and stepped on the landmine, the whole family wiped out. You could see body parts and organs everywhere on the trees. And of course, because there's explosion, mm -hmm. that make the noise to all the other parties, the Vietnamese, the commune, they're gonna come that area to what happened. So we have to move on to the next right. rest area, per se, where we can just kind of hide there. Were you always frightened? What I mean by that is you spent six, seven years with the Khmer Rouge and then doing these uh, runs to the border to buy and sell food which the descriptions in your book, it comes across that that period was just as dangerous as it was being under the Khmer Rouge. As, as a child, were you always scared or is there, does there come a time where you just think, you know, stuff it, we, we're just going to do this and let, let it go? Yeah, scary, probably not. I even look at it, it's like I survived the Khmer Rouge, all the, the hardships, the labors, the lack of nutrients, I survived that. That is probably not really my in my head anymore. Mm -hmm. If I survived that, I could about survive anywhere. Especially with my mom, I said, I'd rather die with her. Yeah. So I always remember everything that she did for me. So. And scary, probably not. Um, now, we have had a Khmer Rouge tribunal, and uh, justice, if you'd call it that, was late for all sorts of political reasons. What is your take on the tribunal, given that at the end of the day, they can I, only prosecute a handful, and most I, of them are gone now, and there's only one left serving a life term in prison? And that my country there, I believe in capital, capital punishment. Right. One third of the population wiped out. My father ordered by the family. Everybody, I'm the only child. So I, in that case, I believe in capital punishment. Even those killed somebody that's not going to bring it back. Mm -hmm. But it, just imagine how many of the millions of children that lost their parents, parents, the husbands lost wives, wives lost husbands. I mean, put that in perspective. This is a human being, and how is that human being to do that to other human beings? And the same race, it's not any other country that come. It's the same, you know, race that kill your own people. I mean, capital punishment, I would definitely support that. You were shunted from one refugee camp to another, from the Thai border, eventually, and the NGOs arrived, and yourself and your mother and other members of your family were singled out and given refugee status in America. How did you find the United States after the nasty, horrible experiences of your home? Yeah. Well, the United States and Cambodia was not really a close friend, historically. I think they always confused between French 
try to colonize it so many of Asian people don't really like the Westerns. So coming in America was like never thought, never dreamt of it. Never exist in my, my head. And one morning we get up, we hide one of the hills. If I remember right, you were hiding in um, basically what I'd call thorn bushes, I guess. You were, you were stuck. We caught there like gunfight three days and three nights. We couldn't get up. It, it just nonstop. Yeah, okay. yeah. I was stuck there. I had to call and help people. Most people were like laughing. How do you get in there? Like, I don't know. So after the three days, three nights, we were trying to come out. And the next day, at the, the water relief refugee came in there. Uh, with a pickup truck, like, hey, you guys cannot stay here anymore. You have to get inside. So they pick up, toss it inside, and they move us to the site, too. That was, you know, the new life. But at least we know no one's going to kill them. Then Reagan was the president back then. They uh, started to accept political refugees. And when you finally did get to America, it must have been a mind-blowing experience. It, it, it certainly has. I came at 17, close to be 18 get off the airplane, it's like, uh, you look at people, like, totally shock of cultures, customs, language, how are you going to survive? You don't speak the language. You're a classic refugee success story. You arrived in America, you worked hard, three, four jobs, you put yourself through school, you uh, obtained a Bachelor of Arts and applied for the United States Secret Service, and for the last 10, 20 years, you've been protecting the president, the vice presidents, and their families. Yes, you know, again, to just come to America, it never thought, never dreamed of. We look at, you know, Japan, Canada, France, Australia, that's what people say. We get more chance to go there, but because I guess my father served under the military during long, long back by the American, they consider one of, like, during the Vietnam, the American went there, so they accept us, you know, to come here. But coming here with no English, nothing, you know, I don't know how much you know about Cambodian. They always believe in certain fortune tellers. Mm-hmm. So you go there, the fortune yeah. teller will tell you future, oh, you got to be this, be that. If a fortune teller tells me, oh, you told you become a street kisser, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Not in a million years have I ever thought about becoming a street kisser. Not even a million years. I never thought I'd become a sick of civil protector and depression walking to the White House like my own house. None of zero. There's millions and billions of people who cannot do that. And a child like me, born in Cambodia, dirt poor family, scavenging plastic, aluminum, making less than a penny to help a mom, here I am. Who was your favorite president who you liked? I mean, you know what? They always been like this. They always been really nice to us. I remember when, uh, during the Bush administration, they assigned me to the, the VP, Jenny, and uh, I joke a lot. And the, so long story short, I was at one of the posts, and Mrs. Cheney, uh, Lynn Cheney, walk around. She is a beautiful woman. Walk around, every knock on a post. I'm like, oh, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? She's like, well, I know you guys hot out here. You know, she always says thanks for your service. Would you need anything? So I was kidding about it. I said, well, you know, lemonade and cookies. <laughs> and, and of course I said, ma'am, I'm only kidding. With about 15 minutes, here comes a plate of cookie and lemonade. And everybody was like, what did, what did you do? I said, I don't know. I told my coworker, I said, I was just kidding. And here she is like, don't you do that again? I said, look, I was kidding. And of course, because she is, you know, a husband, politician, you know, I guess she doesn't take a joke. So I, from there on, I never said anything, you know, jokingly with them. But, you know, we, we come in here, um, you're not the first to ask a question. All of them are nice to us. Um, I started when Bush was in his Iraq war, the war president. Mm-hmm. It's kind of tough. And, of course, Obama came in, Trump came in, and uh, now Biden's for one administration. And we came in as a secret service. We, we don't take politics as a primary goal. We came in as to protect the protectees, so the president, vice president's families, and wife and husband, that's what our job is. I mean, we all have a different personality, different background, different politics, you know? So that's one thing we don't do, we don't, we don't talk about politics. And you returned to yeah. Cambodia uh, with Barack Obama, I think 2012, it was when Cambodia was hosting ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and I actually suspect I might have met you uh, I was in the press conference with Barack Obama at the time. 
But what was it like coming back? Oh, I was the greatest thing ever. And like I say, I might have met you, I don't know. Um, first time I bagged this since 1979. And that was the first time I met my younger sister um, since 79. So coming back, she's 17. And before that, I called my sister, like, hey, uh, how big is the airport? My sister laughing, like, why? I said, well, we get big plans coming in. There are three, four big plans. I mean, they are big. She said, like, well, uh, of course, the prince just passed away. And she told me, like, yeah, they just brought the prince, the prince body over their plan. I said, we got three, four big plans. So you know, remember, my dad was, it took me the one time, fortune stone was a small airport, small airplanes landed there. It's like, oh, it's big now, that was good. Right. So we get off there, get off the plane with my dog, of course, my partner, right? I'm a dog lover, you know, hopefully. I should quickly point out for listeners that uh, you spent a lot of your time working in the K-9 department, have, uh, working dogs with the Secret Service to protect the president. Yeah, I love dogs back in the comments. I love dog. I have dogs coming to America. I have dogs. I was, I'm a, a dog person. I love dogs. My passion for dogs. So I hope, you know, uh, the Prime Minister, some guy Trump said, you know, that's what I want to go back and more and train dogs over there. And his son, uh, Manette. Mm-hmm. So maybe he'll call me. I mean, I'm able to retire him. I, that's my goal is use the, use the knowledge to help Cambodian again to, you know, this is, this is Cambodian 20. 21st century, like not like you know, 100 years ago, whatever. So, then back to the story, I get off, you know, D17, old plane of town. I came out, and like, okay, should I even step out of the airplane first? Because and when my dad took me over there, there's always gunfire explosions, you hear the rockets, and ground is shaking. And uh, I looked outside, it's kind of quiet. I smell, you know, the trash, the trees, the palm trees look outside watching here that they were, you know what? This is Cambodia. And this is 2012 and not 75 anymore. Of course, my dog's name, Wright, at the Belgian Malinois, he's bilingual, of course, he speaks Cambodian and English. Mm-hmm. And he is detect- he's explosion uh, detection. Ex- yeah. Um, he's bilingual. He is the longest living in the service Right now, he's he passed away when it's seven, almost seventeen. Mm-hmm. So took my dog there, spoke you know language to the driver. They're all happy and they see me speak language. Like they're always confused. They're like, you know, you speak Cambodian words. Well. They know I was born here. They know you 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 my you my is good. They say, no, I was born here. Live with the communists. I still have that language to me. And uh, we got there, set everything up, and I called my sister, and she came in. Uh, of course, when I left it, she was like two, three years old. And this, this, I was waiting for her in the hallway, and the car was driving so good, so good, so good. She came and looked at me, looked at me, like, must be her. And she called, and she finally came, and we both hugged, and we both crying like a little baby. So that's the first time I met my sister face to face since 1979. And that was the first time I went back to Cambodia almost 33 years when President Mama was hosting a Asian conference there. Yeah. It was a happy ending. It thank was you. a happy ending. Lord Orn, thank you very much. It's been a delightful chat. His book, A Refugee's American Dream from the Killing Fields of Cambodia to the US Secret Service, has been released on Temple University Press and is available online and I'm sure in all good bookshops. Look on, thank you very much. Yeah, one more thing before you go. Um, I have the audio books coming out uh, yep. in October 10th, and we work on to get the book translated to Cambodian slash Khmer. So looking for that, it's coming up soon. Okay, keep us advised. Thank you very much. Yes, you will do. Thank, thanks for having me, and thank you on your time, sir. Thank you. Hope to talk to you soon.